Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for attending the uh, one o'clock session titled NC Next Gen 911 Overview and Update. My name is Matt Helms and I will be your moderator for this session. Our speaker today is Matthew McLam with the NCGIA. Matthew McLam is the Assistant CGIA Director for the State of North Carolina and serves as the GIS Project Manager for the Next Gen 911 Project. Mr. McLam has been part of the NCGIS community for more than 12 years and has experience at both the local and state level. And if, we're gonna hold the questions until the end of the session today, but if you have any, please put them in the chat and he will also share his contact information. So if you have questions, please contact him. Let's welcome Mr. McLam. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate it. So as Matt mentioned, uh, I'm Matt McLam with the state of North Carolina and I'll be sharing an update today on the progress that's been made thus far regarding next gen across the state, uh, where we are currently, uh, where we're going, what the next steps are. So looking through the list of people that were joining in the waiting room before you were added, I see there are a wide range of different people. Um, there are people that I know you're already live on EziNet. I know that you are in the process of going live with an upcoming due date. And then there are some of you that have an update or a due date that's coming up uh, you know, down the road. Uh, with that said, I want to kind of start off with a poll. Uh, they're actually going to launch this poll for us and get some more information about uh, GIS data layers that you maintain. Uh, so that poll should be up there. I'm going to leave this poll open for a couple of minutes, but if you will, uh, just select which of the GIS data layers in that list that you maintain. There is an option for all of the above as well as none of the above, um, or you can select individual uh, layers. So um, there's about 30% of you that have voted, so I want to give it a little bit longer, give you a chance to get your vote in there. This really just helps us see where people are, you know, what data layers you're maintaining, what you're uh, responsible for, and spoiler alert, uh, these are the required data layers for NextGen 911, uh, and we'll talk about that here a bit in just a moment. Um, so uh, we're about 74%, I'll give it to the one minute mark before I actually um, end this poll. Uh, give you just a moment to ask if anyone else needs to add their vote in there. So these are layers are very important for the NextGen process. Uh, GIS data is what drives uh, NextGen, it's what drives call routing in 911 uh, in the state of North Carolina moving forward. So it's very, these data layers are very, very important. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and for the sake of time and end the poll here and see where we're at and share these results out. Um, you are able to view these results. So we can see that the vast majority, almost half of you that voted, uh, maintain all of these data layers. You're responsible for the maintenance of these data layers. There's some of you that maintain just the roads or the addresses or the fire law EMS boundaries. There are also some of you that do not maintain these but are still interested you know, in the process and, and what the steps are. You may have other people in your group that maintain these data layers or other people within your county, uh, within your city or municipality or PSAP. So I uh, appreciate uh, everybody taking the time to vote on these. So where are we uh, in NextGen? What's the background on the project? Um, so just real quick today, I'm gonna go for about 15, 20 minutes. I wanna try to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. As Matt mentioned, please feel free to send those in via chat. If you have a question that comes up while I'm talking, uh, it's not gonna distract me, go ahead and send it to chat. Matt will catalog those and shoot them over to me, uh, call them out once we get to the end of the presentation. If you think of something or you just wanna email me, I'll have my contact information up a couple times during the presentation. So the migration in, onto the EziNet is ongoing with AT&T driving this uh, with the 911 board. CGIA has partnered with the 911 board to provide GIS support for this process, along with Geocom. Uh, Geocom was the vendor that was uh, selected by the 911 board uh, for the GIS services portion. And we are working with them closely on the outreach education and GIS support that's needed to support all 127 PSAPs across the state. Um, I think there are about 115 primary PSAPs and about uh, somewhere around 12 there are secondary PSAPs in that total. There are some great resources that have been put together, whether you are uh, new to the NextGen project, maybe you haven't you know, got into the data 
editing process and started preparing your data yet, or maybe you are uh, neck deep in it, or maybe you have gone through it, you're live on i3, all the information on this website that I'm about to show you is still very relevant. Uh, the links to that, uh, these websites are there. Um, you can also find them on the state NCDIT site. Look for Next Generation 911. I encourage you to go to this website. It gives you background information about NetGen, not just from a GIS perspective, but overall. You know, you may be wondering, what is ESINet? What is the I3 protocol? Uh, you may hear RFAI, which is being phased out. You may hear all this information. This is a great resource to go and read about that. We're not going to spend time reading through this today, um, but it does give you a lot of that information. The 911 board has four regional coordinators across the state. That's Angie, Tina, Stephanie, and David. And you can see here they're color coded. You can find your county and identify who your 911 regional coordinator is. They can help with a lot of those 911 specific questions, a lot of the ESINET questions. Um, and then we're also here available to you as well, CGI, to answer those GIS questions. So if you're not sure who your regional coordinator is, um, you can talk to your PSAP or you can look at this and find that information out as well. These three buttons at the bottom that have the play icons, these are great video resources for you. We're going to talk about GIS Data Hub in just a moment. Uh, there were two uh, or there are educational sessions that occurred in June of 2019. We're going to mention those in a moment. There's a two part recording of those sessions here. So if you miss those or you want to recap, you want to get some more information, those two videos are a great resource. The next uh, page I want you to look at here is this green uh, teal button here. It, this is NetGen 911 GIS services. This side is focused on the GIS side of things, which is why many of you are likely attending this uh, session. It gives you background on that, on the GIS and what that means. It also gives you information about important things that you need to know, a lot of frequently asked questions. So you can come in if you're like, what is a provisioning boundary? Uh, I'm gonna mention that it's important to know what a provisioning boundary is. Essentially, that is the boundary, the area that you are responsible for maintaining the GIS data. So if you're maintaining roads, addresses, those fire law EMS boundaries, PSAP boundary, uh, what is the area within that that you're gonna upload data for? Um, I'm not gonna be uploading data. If I'm in Wake County, I'm not gonna upload data that is residing in Johnson County. They're responsible for that. There are some nuances. Uh, there are some areas where we have jurisdictions that go outside of counties and those are being addressed on a case by case basis to help people understand how to change these. For the most part, uh, the vast majority of agencies are using for their provisioning boundary uh, is likely the county boundary. It's not always the case, but that's usually the starting point. And we recommend using the state's geodetic survey county boundaries as the starting point. So this is a great resource to go through and read all of the frequently asked questions. Associated files are, a, are common files that are for you to download. This is tool package critical for you to have this and to access this information. In this zip file, there is a spreadsheet that actually breaks down the format for NetGen, uh, the schema. It describes all of the fields. It gives you examples of those fields. It even includes an XML a file so you can create a blank file geodatabase that already has domains uh, populated, already has all the fields populated to follow the NINA standard. So great resource. The GIS Data Hub user guide. If you're not sure how to use GIS Data Hub, maybe you haven't been in it in a while, your due date's coming up, you need to refresh yourself. This is a great resource to look at. Uh, this was very recently updated. You'll likely be seeing some communication in the coming weeks that this uh, user guide has been updated with some additional uh, info. I3 Ready GIS Maintenance Document, we're gonna review that at the end of this presentation. Um, the presentation that was given uh, that I mentioned in June, and then some contact information, which I'll be sharing at the end of this presentation. So I encourage you to go to this web these websites, look at this information, you can find it on the state's DIT website and uh, learn more about uh, NetGen from a general perspective, as well as from the GIS side. So uh, Geocom's GIS Data Hub. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Geocom was selected as the GIS vendor for the NetGen project. And as part of that, they've provided a hub called GIS Data Hub, where you upload your data and field map your data to ensure that uh, it can be ingested and merged into a statewide data set and used for call routing for NetGen 911 purposes. 
this uh, hub brings in your data. It uh, performs quality control checks, which we'll look at a sample report shortly. It lets you know where there are errors. It compares your alley records. Uh, that's your, your phone uh, information, which has addresses tied to your phone records. It compares that against your road center lines and your address data. It gives you a match rate. It tells you how many matched, how many did not match, and the ones that did not match, it tells you why they did not match uh, so that you can go in and, and work on cleaning that data up. So GIS Data Hub is very important. It, you know, it's your portal for you to upload your data, to perform error checks, to get those reports back, fits your data, re-upload until your data is I3 ready. What does I3 ready mean? We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Uh, this hub also is the, the starting point for that data to then go to AT&T and be merged with the rest of the state's data with your neighbors. So if you're already part of GIS Data Hub, uh, you can already go in, you can download statewide data, data that's already made it through. Uh, you can look at that information as your neighbors are uploading data, you can begin to get that information. So no longer are you having to call your neighboring PSAP and request road data or request uh, their boundaries or their response areas or their address data. Uh, you can go in and download that directly from uh, what's being output from GIS Data Hub and Geocom. The NextGen 911 GIS outreach, as I mentioned, uh, started in June of 2019 with regional workshops. There were numerous, many regional workshops that were conducted throughout the state since September. Uh, the goals of those many regional workshops were really to be focused uh, on individual PSAPs with one-on-one -on -one attention uh, with no more than three or four people in a session at a time. Uh, during those workshops, those mini regional workshops, we review all the data preparation steps, review how to upload and field map your data into GIS Data Hub, and review GIS Data Hub results and how to correct those errors and get your data prepared. Uh, in March, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, we, were, we shifted to virtual meetings and uh, we continue to conduct those meetings on an as needed basis. Um, there are three of contacts, which I'll share at the end of this meeting, myself, Anna Verrill, who's also with CGIA, and Brandon Moore, who's with Geocom. Uh, we are conducting these meetings, we're scheduling these meetings. We've uh, divvied up the entire state amongst the three of us, so we're each assigned to a PSAP or a county, and working directly with you to ensure your data is ready and prepared for your transition. So if you do have questions or want to reach out and request a meeting and a one-on-one -on -one session, you can email me directly and uh, I will set up a meeting with you or have Anna or Brandon reach out to set up a meeting with you. Uh, we can do a screen share, we can share our screen, we can look at your screen and look at your data, which may be more useful, walk you through the entire process and uh, make sure you're ready if you uh, need assistance. So what data is required by GIS data layers? I told you at the beginning, it was spoiler alert. Uh, it was the layers that uh, were in the pole. So road center lines, address points, the fire law and EMS boundaries, PSAT boundary, and the alley database um, and provisioning boundary. I'll come back. I mentioned the provisioning boundary. Uh, it's important to have that. Uh, we need to know and make sure there are no gaps. If we have, again, Wake County and Johnson County that upload, uh, their provisioning boundary and there's a gap between those two counties, uh, then who's responsible for uploading that data between those two counties? We can't have that. So that's why the provisioning boundary is important to make sure that we have all these other layers filled in across the entire state. So when a call gets placed to 911 and it's using GIS data to route it to the correct PSAP, that that call is going to match against GIS data and that call is going to be routed appropriately. The alley database, which I briefly mentioned earlier, is also important. Uh, there are several different uh, alley database providers. It's, deal, it's tied to the phone company, so it's either going to be like AT&T or Entrato is maintaining that. It could be uh, maintained by uh, CenturyLink. So we have a list of all the all of you all the PSAPs and who maintains the alley database currently. If you do not have a copy of your alley database, please reach out to us. We can check and let you know who your provider is if you're not aware, and give you the next steps to get a copy of that. Um, and depending on who your provider is, we may be able to request that for you. So that is very important because of the requirements for GIS uh, data. The data must follow the NINA uh, standard. Uh, all PSAPs uh, moving forward must go live on ESINET as I3. And to be I3 ready, 
uh, here are the requirements. All of the required layers that I just mentioned must be uploaded into GIS Data Hub. When the alley database is compared to your road center lines, that match rate must be 98% or greater. If it's below 98%, you'll need to work on the errors that are identified in your report to ensure you get to 98% or higher. Obviously, the higher match rate, the better off you're going to be. Um, the more calls that are going to match, the more accurate and reliable the data is going to be. And there also must not be any critical errors uh, in the data whenever that's reported, uh, when that report comes back. So I'm quickly going to bring over a sample report where I'm not going to spend time to go through all this. We don't have time to really digest all this information, but this is a sample report of what you would get back. As we can see, this particular agency, their match rate is 99.1%. They're great. They meet that criteria um, for the alley to road center line match rate. If this was below 98%, they would need to work on any of these five error categories that were presented back to them to correct their GIS data or upload, update the alley to ensure that they're able to get over 98%. Um, so as you can see, they still have 102 records in the alley database that do not match a street in their GIS data. So that's something for them to work on and work towards. I'm just gonna quickly go down um, to the roads. As you can see, there's an error report for each of the required data layers. You can see here in the road center lines, there are uh, just over 3,400 segments. We can see that uh, there are three road segments that are going outside of their provisioning boundary. So that is gonna come back as a critical error. You're not allowed to upload data outside of your provisioning area. That's very important. Here they have no critical errors on these other checks. So there are no range overlaps. All the critical fields are populated. There's no multi-point, uh, no multi-part geometries. The parity checks out and there are no duplicate IDs. So uh, they're close to being I3 ready. They're not quite there because they still have critical errors um, across the board. So anywhere there, there are errors that are highlighted in red, these are critical errors. We must see a zero on all these to be considered I3 ready. So one of the things that we can do is work with you to make sure we review your uh, data, review that error report with you, make sure you understand that and understand what needs to be done to become I3 ready. Uh, again, that's where those screen shares come into play. This dashboard is linked on the GIS page. If I scroll back up to this GIS page we looked at earlier, if you click this, this is just a screen grab. If you click this, it's gonna take you to a live dashboard. This is gonna show you where you're at, where your neighbors are at. Um, if your data is I3 ready and you're still in GIS Data Hub, your data has not been pushed at and you're going to sit here until you're closer to your due date. Once you're closer to your due date, your data will be pushed to at and and Entrado, the EGDMS. That's the ultimate production point. That's where you're going to end up. So you can see we still have some agencies across the state where they've had a user created in GIS Data Hub, but they've not uploaded data. We have some that have uploaded data, but they have not included their alley. We have some that have uploaded their data, they have included their alley and they're still working on getting their data prepared. So I encourage you to go and check this out. If you're not sure when your due date is, you can click on any of these points and actually see if you have a due date assigned. Um, you can see the status of where you're at. Um, if I click on um, uh, some of these uh, perquimens, actually went live uh, recently, I think it was last week on 826. Um, so you can go in and get this information here. It's very important um, information. I encourage you to go and check that out. Um, we're coming up on our time. So I'm gonna zip through these last couple of slides real quick to make sure I give you a chance to ask any questions. We are coordinating with our neighboring states, Virginia, Tennessee, South Carolina, and Georgia. In summary, we've had discussions with all these states regarding the borders. Uh, data sharing is in various stages. The Virginia line is almost completely agreed upon and signed off. There's still some areas that are being worked on. Tennessee, we're actively sharing data with them back and forth uh, on a case by case, county by county basis to uh, work out any areas that need to be aligned. South Carolina, North Carolina border, we've agreed to use the NC Geodetic Survey uh, boundary there for that state border. If there are any areas that need to shift a bit, we're handling those as needed. And then Georgia, we've had discussions with them. Data sharing has not yet started, um, but we're a little bit further ahead than Georgia at the moment in the process. So that will be coming with uh, those few counties along the North Carolina, Georgia border. Key items to consider. Those borders are very, very important. 
It's important for you to work with your neighbors. It's important for you to uh, coordinate with them. We're happy to host sessions with you and your neighbors to work on, do a working session and actually work on those borders, make sure that every, everything's lined up. It has to be lined up almost vertice to vertice, not quite. There are some tolerances, but we really need to make sure that the data matches. There are no major gaps or overlaps also with the states, not just with your uh, interstate borders, the ones outside the state as, or with other states as well. Your GIS due date is set approximately 70 days before your PSAP is scheduled to go live. So just over two months before your PSAP is scheduled to transition, the GIS data must be ready because AT&T and Entrado have to process that data and sign off on it before they can go live. So it's very important to make sure you're, you're following that and you know what that is. Look at that map, contact me, uh, any one of us on the screen I'm about to show you, make sure you reach out to us. Even if you have a due date that's a few months away, please upload often. It helps us keep an eye on it. We check on it. If we see something that doesn't look right, we can reach out to you and help you. So please make sure you're uploading. An important date is February 1st, 2021. Even if you're going live in June of 2021, we're still targeting for all PSAPs to have their GIS data ready by February 1st to ensure that we can meet the goal of everyone transitioning uh, in 2021 to EziNet. So please keep that date in mind. You're live on I-3, what now? Uh, your involvement does not cease uh, once you go live on I-3. The importance for the GIS data does not diminish. It's still very, very important. It's critical to the process. GIS data is, will continue to drive 911 call routing in the state of North Carolina. That's its purpose uh, in this project. Timely updates are critical to ensure calls are routed to the correct uh, PSAP. If you have a new subdivision that goes in and you haven't uploaded that data uh, to GIS Data Hub so it can be made available and pushed into the call routing process, um, calls are, are at risk of not being routed properly uh, that come from that subdivision. So it's very important. At a minimum, we recommend monthly updates. You're familiar with your jurisdiction. You're familiar with how often things are changing. Um, if things are changing more frequently, um, you know, more frequent updates may be needed. So we'll kind of leave that up to you. There is a document on the website. I mentioned it in the, in the files. I'm not gonna bring it up for the sake of time. It's here on the slide as a screenshot. Um, it gives you information about what to do. You know, day two, after you're live, what's the process look like? And again, has important links and uh, uh, contact information. So here's the contact information I've promised. Um, Matt, I'm gonna open it up if there are questions. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us directly uh, with any questions that you have. And again, if you just wanna have a call and go through this in more detail, 20 minutes is a very short amount of time to cram a lot of this information in. Usually these meetings that we have are about two hours to go through everything. So I really do encourage you to reach out, uh, get, send us an email. Uh, I'll be happy to set up a call with you and answer any questions you have. So Matt? If there are any questions that have come through, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, we, we had uh, two questions and one reply. Um, I don't know if you want to look in the chat, but from uh, Robert Cushman, how frequently can we get a al new Alley database? So uh, that depends, and that's a great question. Um, it depends on who your provider is. Um, you can, uh, Sometimes it's limited. If you are limited and they're going to charge, please let us know because there are possibilities that the state can work to either get one without charging or reimburse for a charge. Um, if you get an alley that uh, from, a com from a, your telephone provider and you need to make updates to it, make those requests to make the updates. Let's say you need to change uh, street names for a street. They have it spelled incorrectly. Make those requests, but also edit the alley that you have locally uh, to reflect those changes, knowing that they're gonna make that update. That way you can continue the process of seeing how those errors are gonna go away so you can see what else you need to work on. Uh, Cause sometimes that can take them a bit of time. That way it doesn't hold you up. Um, now just make notes of what you request to be changed. So once we request a new alley, that that information, we need to make sure they did update it appropriately. And AT&T and Entrado take care of getting new alley information when it's time for you to go live. You don't have to re-request that, they take care of that. And I see the question, what if alley includes addresses beyond your provisioning boundary? Um, that is, we'll need to make a request uh, to ensure that those are removed from your alley and they'll need to identify where those should be included. Those are likely a conversation that we'll need to have with you and also potentially with your alley provider as well. 
And we had another question. Um, could you email us a copy of your presentation file? And this session is recorded. It will be available on the conference website after the event. Um, we could probably get a copy of the presentation if that's okay, maybe and put it alongside yep. of that. Yep. Just have the presentation. That's fine. I'll make a copy of the presentation available. And again, if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd be happy to walk through those with you. I don't see any other questions in the yeah, chat. I don't see any more other than some chatter. And uh, to Chris Contreras, yes, there was a poll at the beginning. Yeah, Chris, that poll is just basically asking what data layers you're responsible for maintaining um, roads, addresses, fire law, EMS boundaries, and PSAP boundary, or all of the above. And so, yeah, if you have any questions about your alley provider or how often you can get that or you're running into issues hitting a roadblock, please reach out. That's, uh, we run into that, something we're happy to help with. If it's something that's maintained by A911 or AT&T side of things, uh, we can make those requests directly to them and get that alley usually within a few days. Um, so pretty quick turnaround. And not seeing any other questions, I appreciate everybody's time today. Everybody's uh, uh, done a, a great uh, job updating their information, um, getting the data in there. Uh, you know, we try to keep track and reach out to you. So you may hear from me or Anna or Brandon uh, as you get close to your date, uh, just to check in and make sure things are progressing. We're here to help out any way that we can. Uh, again, we appreciate everybody's time and those, you know, all those green that you saw in the map wasn't a result, wasn't just by happenstance, it's all of your great hard work and we appreciate that. And I think we have one more question come in also. Well, okay. From, uh, um, Kat. How? Yep. So Kat, uh, Kat asked how might bulk updates be done to the alley? Um, it depends on the system. Uh, some of them have a process where you can submit bulk changes. Um, so remove, uh, moving values from location unit to the notes. Um, so Kat, that may be one we have to look at uh, your alley provider and see how they can handle that. Um, I know there's a way to do it if it's through A911, um, but if it's another provider like CenturyLink, there's a different process. So it's just one you have to work directly with them and identify how they accept it. Some of them accept bulk changes, some of them you have to do them on a more one by one basis, unfortunately. All right. Okay. Well if there's uh, no more questions, and if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to email Matt. Um, as I said before, this session is recorded. It will be available on the uh, conference website after the uh, conference. And I believe we have a 15 minute break. The next sessions will start at 1.45. So, and Matt, I think you got a stand in devotion, if I'm not uh, mistaken. It's hard to sell, but <laughs> I think everybody enjoyed it. All right, great. Thanks, but, Matt. Yeah, Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks for everybody for attending. Thank you.